Hello, my name is Stanford Gibson. I am the Sediment Transport Specialist at HEC, and I'm going to talk to you about how to use the new Observed Sediment Data features in HEC RAS. So we updated the Observed Sediment Data features quite a bit in version 6.0. There was a very simple kind of limited functionality in previous versions, but we're going to show you how to use these new ones that are in fact new in version 6.0. And so you can put any form of observed data in the sediment model now in HC RAS in profile form. As you'll see, you know, you can match it up with one of our output variables, or you can just put in a brand new sediment variable type if you'd like. But we're going to deal with really the most helpful, I think, and the you know, most common observed data that you would use to calibrate a sediment model, and that is volume change over time. And so the most common way to get volume change data is to find old cross sections on your system and then go and reoccupy them. And so if you have this set of old cross sections on your system and you go and reoccupy them decades later, you get bed change. You get these elevation changes that show up as you know, two cross sections. Well, you can go and compute an area from that. And then you know the distance between the cross sections. So you can turn these repeated cross sections into a volume associated with this computational node. All right, so what we get from this repeated cross section computation is the volume change over a period of time at a particular computational node or cross section. Now that's a pretty simple computation to do, but it can also be tedious and there are actually a number of ways it can go wrong. We have a separate talk on that. John Shelley has a talk that we're putting up on YouTube that goes through the potential failure modes of that computation. Dr. Shelley also has a tool that he developed with Dr. Philip Bailey, which is called the Cross-Section Viewer. This is a publicly available tool that's available at this address, and they have a techno out on it. And so you know, this obviously deserves its own video, but there are tools available that can help you develop this repeated cross-section data that we're going to use today. But at this point, we're just going to say, okay, we did that. We compared these repeated cross-sections. We computed a volume change at each location, and here it is. And so here is our RAS model. It's a very simple RAS model. We, we, we just have a location for each of these historic cross sections where we got volume change at. And then for each of those cross sections, we have volume change between 1952 and 1971 at each of the cross sections. Now, that's fine, but another way that we tend to look at these data is what we call the longitudinal cumulative volume curve. And that is going to, again, be volume in meters cubed. But the way we do the longitudinal cumulative volume curve is we sum the volume change from upstream to downstream. And there are a couple advantages of that. One, it gets rid of a lot of the noise. This particular application, because there's only 17 cross sections as a reservoir, so deposition is very predictable. Uh, doesn't have a lot of noise, but a lot of other applications, riverine applications do. So it smooths out the noise, but the longitudinal cumulative volume curve also allows you to compare results that have different numbers of cross sections. Because what you do is you just sum the volume change from upstream to downstream. And so we're going to enter both of those results into this HC RAS sediment model as observed data. So I'm going to open the sediment data, either by pushing the sediment data button or by going to edit sediment data. And then I'm going to go to the options menu. And at the very bottom of the options menu, you have observed data and profile, which is the only data type you can put in right now. And so I have this observed data editor with a row for each cross section. And so I am going to go and put in my measured volume change. And so I'll say add observed profile. And this is the editor that we use to define an observed profile. Now what you'll see is you have a few options. In general, you want to tie your observed data to an actual data output that HTC RAS computes. And so if you choose the appropriate data output, then HCC RAS will replicate it with an observed tag, so then you can compare them in the viewer. And so we're going to do the cumulative volume change over the course of the simulation. And that is going to be volume bed change cumulative total. 
And so the cumulative means that it's the bed change cumulative over the course of the cross section and total means for all grain classes. By GC means by grain class. And so that'll break it down into the individual grain classes. And so I'm gonna choose that variable. Now, it also asks you for a date and a time. If you leave this blank, then this profile will appear in all time steps. Now, is that totally appropriate? No, I mean, this should probably only show up at 1971 when it actually was measured, but it's sometimes helpful to see how you're approaching it over time. And so for this one, I'm just going to leave the date and time blank so you can kind of see how that works. And so we'll get a volume bed change cumulative um, with no date and time. But for the longitudinal cumulative volume curve, let's actually give that a date and a time. And so this model was set up from 1952, when the original cross sections were taken just before the dam was closed, to 1971, when the second set of cross sections were taken. And so we're going to go in and we're going to say that that September 1971 is actually when we're going to evaluate our longitudinal cumulative volume curve. So we'll go to Options, Observe Data, Profile, and we will add a longitudinal cumulative volume change total, but we're going to give it a date. And so now that is going to be attached to that particular date. And so if that doesn't totally line up exactly with one of your profile outputs, that's all right. We're going to attach it to the closest one. And so then there's one other way that you can add data that is interesting. So the most useful way to use observed data is to compare it to some output variable that RAS generates so you can calibrate. But maybe that's not the way you want to do this. Maybe you want to compare concentration to some other variable, some other, you know, maybe biological variable or infrastructure variable. And so you can choose to have an output variable that has nothing to do with the RAS output. Let's say, for example, you know, you want to, for some reason, correlate the output of your sediment model to the relative abundance of capybaras. Well, you can go in and put capybaras as your new output variable. You can either give it a date and time so it'll show up attached to one profile, or you can just leave it in there so that it will be associated with all time and press OK. And now you have a capybaras field. Now, one of the other advantages to specifying a date and time is that you can actually specify multiple dates and times for the same output variable, and we will attach them to different profiles within the same time series. And so that can be really helpful if you're doing a multi time series evaluation or if you have intermediate profiles or evaluation points within your calibration. OK, so I'm just going to go get these data and copy them and paste them into the first two fields. And you'll notice that I've formatted these without commas. The way that copying and pasting works in RAS, if you have a comma, sometimes it truncates it. So I've formatted these without commas. And then let's just put in some random capybara data. We're actually in the wrong continent here for capybaras, but I don't care because I think they're adorable. We'll say, hey, there's a lone rogue male capybara there. There's a little family of four, of three here, and then there's a group of 12 there. And we'll say, okay. Okay, now we're going to save our sediment data. We're going to open our quasi and steady sediment simulation, and we're gonna compute. All right, so that took about 59 seconds to run. One of the new features in 6.0 that I really like is that we do a mass balance. We report a sediment budget on all of the input terms and all of the output terms in your model, which can help you identify breaks in your sediment budget. But now we're gonna go to view sediment output. Now, those of you who've been modeling sediment for a while know that we have a long history of sediment viewers, which we've continued to make available for a little while because there are some people who have their workflows tied to these. But we've tried to combine the advantages of each of these sediment viewers into a new product in 6.0. 
And so this is the new sediment viewer in HCRAS. And so if these, this is the list of variables that we have available. And one of the interesting things in version 6.0 is just like previous versions, you can choose your output level. I'm running level three right now, but you can also select customized variables. So if you want to compare to a random or you know underrated sediment variable, you can go in and choose it and add it to level three. So you don't have to get all of the variables just to get one variable in level six anymore. In fact, you can choose only customized and create a list of customized variables that you want to work with. And so if we scroll down to volume bed change cumulative, you can see that, well, we've got that computed, but we've also got the observed data. We've just taken the same thing and tagged observed onto it. So that's gonna be your, your observed data set. And so if we go to profiles and we go to the final profile, cause that's what we're comparing to. And we turn on volume bed change cumulative. That is what we computed. And here are our observed data. And so, yes, this is a project that I worked really hard on and probably over calibrated, to be honest. Um, but this is actually a very good sediment calibration. You can see that we have our observed data and our computed data, and the volume change is tracking pretty well. Why is there a peak in the volume change? Well, because it's a reservoir. And a reservoir deposits a delta that moves forward and gets thicker as it gets deeper. And so, you know, the peak deposition here is the edge of the delta progress where it's starting to get into deeper and deeper water. You know, in another 30 to 50 years, this point right here will be even higher. All right, so that's the basic gist. Now, we made this persistent, and so we didn't attach a date to it. So it doesn't matter which day we choose or which profile we choose to compare it to, the observed data will show up. So next, let's turn these off and go up to our longitudinal cumulative volume change. And you can see that we've got the computed variable there and also the observed. And so if we turn these both on for that final time step, you can see that we actually have very good match here. And this is one of the values of the longitudinal cumulative volume curve. You can tell the whole story in one glance. You know, a positive slope is deposition, a negative slope is erosion, but I can come here and the total longitudinal cumulative volume change at the downstream end of your model is actually your total mass balance over the course of the whole model, the mass that deposited um, throughout all time and space. And so that's really valuable. And it's also really valuable to compare these curves if one of these curves has higher resolution than the other. Because it's cumulative from upstream to downstream, resolution doesn't matter. And so you can see that we're also reproducing the result well with longitudinal cumulative volume curve. But because we specified a date, it only shows up on the profile closest to that date. If you choose a different date, it doesn't show up there. Okay, so then finally, let's go look at our capybaras. And so capybaras is not something that RAS computes in the sediment model. We are not a dynamic biological model. Um, you'll have to go to the EFM, the ecosystem function model, which is a model that HEC develops for that. But if we go down our list, we'll see capybaras observed has been added to the model. And so now if we turn on the profile, we see our capybaras. And so we could go and try to correlate that somehow with, I don't know, the D50 of the cover layer, or, you know, I don't know, maybe the, uh, the shear stress. If you're looking for some sort of correlation between capybaras and a sediment parameter, which you should not find because these data were entirely contrived, but then Another thing that you'll notice is that the default colors are a little bit random in this editor and maybe not exactly what you want. That's something we're working on in future versions of 6.0 itself, but you can easily change that. Right click and go to lines and symbols. And you can say, you know what, capybaras are brown. Let's not use red. And by the way, I want to have these are ob observations, so I want points, and capybaras are huge, so I'm going to make these points huge. And there you go. All right, so that is a very basic introduction to the new observed data feature in HEC RAS, and this should make calibration a lot easier. It should be able to help you do additional work inside of RAS without having to go external. If you do want to go external, if you do want to go to 
a spreadsheet to maybe evaluate your residuals or something like that. Residual analysis is something we're working on in the sediment model to help you with your calibrations. But right now you still have to do it external to RAS. You can click on table here to get the raw data. This HEC RAS sediment user manual video was funded in part by the Regional Sediment Management R&D unit of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and look for more of these to help you navigate some of the new tools in version 6.0.